candidates who were uprooted. Thanks to Justice Kudzu and the senior member of the Chinar Foundation, Mr. Vivek Tankha, and its members to taking an initiative. I'm hopeful today's forum on the Kashmir, the way forward democracy and disorder would be more productive. We again have lined up great speakers and like-minded people, and like our Ibadat Khana chairman, the Sawar Jalali to introduce the speaker. And yes, before that, let me remind you again, the core principle of Ibadat Khana is to foster peaceful, just and inclusive society, free from fear and violence. Our guiding principle is based on a conviction that democracy is the best known form of government to promote peace and prosperity, and the state should be governed by the rule of law. Mr. Tasawar, it's all yours. Welcome everybody once again. Thank you, Ritu. Uh, you rightly pointed out, um, there is, a, people are very passionate and there is a strong need of mm -hmm. such debate. Uh, an inclusive debate, which is fair, just, and not one-sided. It's not a monologue, it's a dialogue. Uh, I totally concur, and uh, thanks again, Ritu, for the intro. Uh, we certainly want to keep it uh, to an hour, if possible. So yeah. uh, um, uh, our I think he had some uh, event, so he could not join us. Uh, right now, he will join us in about half oh. <clears throat> So, um, we have um, tonight a great panel of speakers. Uh, we are still waiting for, you know, a few folks to join. However, while we wait, they might have to... I think that's uh, Vishamokul. I'm going to mute all so that... Um, <clears throat> So if you guys, uh, so you'll have to unmute yourself when we start. So I'm sorry, I'm going to unmute everyone so that we can hear. Uh, <clears throat> tonight we have uh, with us uh, Justice Markande Kaju, who is also a patron for Ibadat Khana and Chinar Foundation. Uh, Justice Kaju does not need any introduction. He has been um, the judge at the Supreme Court of India for many years also the chairman for Press Council of India and founder of uh, Kalidas Foundation, uh, India Unification. Um, thought and I'll let him talk a little more about that. We're also uh, joined by Dr. Vijay Saswa. Uh, and I'll introduce each of the speaker as they come in. Uh, but we're also joined by Dr. I mean, Mr. Muzaffar Shah. Uh, Mr. Zuan, Jeevan Zuchi and Professor Wahid Sadiq. He's going to join hopefully soon. Um, so tonight, I'll let uh, Mr. Justice Markhande Kaju to give us an intro, and then I'll probably invite Dr. Saswal after that, uh, and I'll introduce them as well. So Justice Kaju, um, uh, I think the topic tonight is we discussed uh, Kashmir the way forward, uh, how issues are uh, being handled, if there are any issues in Kashmir, especially after August 5th, uh, 2019, are they improving? Was 370 the right thing or the wrong thing to remove that? And, um, and how is the economy overall, uh, you know, in part of Kashmir? We had several discussions on that. So I'll hand it over to you, just Kaju, and so that you can enlighten us with your views. You're, uh, so, Jessica, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, let me see if I can unmute. Am I yeah. audible yeah. now? Now, yes, we can hear you now. Great. Good morning, everybody in America, and good evening, everybody in India. I had said in the last uh, webinar of Ibadat Khana, certain very fundamental things which everybody must understand. See, it is in the nature of things that in every society, in every country, there will be some grievances among the people. And therefore, 
there has to be a forum or several fora for peaceful ventilation of those grievances. Otherwise, those grievances will be ventilated violently. This was understood best by the British rulers who were great administrators. They had ruled almost half the world at one time. Uh, they, in their own country, set up such fora like parliament, like the judiciary and so on, where grievances could be ventilated peacefully. And when our constitution was made, we borrowed those British principles. <clears throat> what has unfortunately happened from 5th August 2019 is that these fora have disappeared where people could ventilate grievances peacefully. Kashmir has been gagged down. There's no freedom of speech, no freedom of media. Many people are still under arrest and 40 restrictions have not been removed. See, all this is driving the Kashmiri people towards militancy because they will then ventilate grievances violently. I've repeatedly been saying this must be understood that you have to allow people to ventilate grievances peacefully. And that is why on the last occasion, we had passed certain resolutions which were conveyed by Mr. Vivek Nankha, member of parliament, who is the chairman of Chinan Foundation, to the prime minister and the home minister in which we had said you must restore democracy to Kashmir. You must hold elections to the state assembly. You must restore freedom of media, freedom of uh, speech. And you must set free the uh, people under detention like Mehbooba, Mufti and so on. You see, these people are not realizing these hardliners that they are driving Kashmiri people towards militancy. And incidents I see on the internet are happening again and again, where uh, some militants are killed, some of our soldiers are killed. No. See, this is not a wise thing which is being done by the Indian government. So I again would appeal to the Indian government to understand that you have to uh, restore democratic freedom to the people of Kashmir. You have to revive the Kashmiri economy. Mr. Muzaffar Shah rightly pointed out on the last webinar that the position is that tourism industry has uh, practically shut down, which was a big industry in Kashmir, the horticulture industry, the hotels are lying, uh, lying uh, vacant, um, these houseboats are lying vacant. See, you are, half a million people have been driven to unemployment. Now what will an unemployed young man do? Either he commits suicide or he picks up a gun. What else will he do? So th this is a short-sighted policy and I uh, appeal to the government to realize this. Act as the British administrators who were perhaps the greatest administrators in the world has seen. Very far-sighted people. They, they, when, even when they were ruling India, they permitted certain uh, freedom to the people of India. And that is how their rule lasted so long. So I would appeal to the Indian government to restore democratic freedom, restore the economy of Kashmir, restore the state status to Kashmir. That is the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Kajal Saab. Very brief to the point, uh, in line with the views of Ibadat Khana as well as um, Chinar Foundation. I just wanted to couple, make a couple of announcements. Um, I just received a message from Mr. Tanka that he has to go in an urgent meeting and he'll try to join as soon as he is done. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, and one more disclosure, uh, this meeting is being recorded and will be published and obviously is covered by Indica News <clears throat> uh, for a later publication. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our uh, special guest tonight, um, Dr. Vijay Saswal. And just kind of a little brief about him. He's a specialist in nuclear fuel cycle technologies and has served as a member of US Department of Commerce, 
uh, Seoul Nuclear Trade Advisory Committee, SYNTAC, and an, in an advisory position. <clears throat> he is a founding steering committee member of Indo-US uh, Brain Trust, uh, NGO set up, in set up in 2016 to promote and enhance um, high technology and scientific collaboration between the US and India. Uh, the Kashmiri Diaspora Association, KOA USA, presented him with an award in 1999 for his efforts to educate and reach out to the US administration and the US Congress on the plight of Kashmiri Pandit refugees. In 2019, he was honored with the Hindu American Foundation, HAF, award for the advancement of Hindu human rights for his lifelong contribution to advancing human rights of minorities in Kashmir. Uh, Dr. Sazal is also a founding member of Indo-American Kashmiri Forum. So with that, Dr. Sazal, I hand it over to you. If you can keep it brief, would appreciate so that we can wrap up uh, in an hour or so. So it's all yours, Dr. Sazal. Please go ahead, unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, uh, and, uh, uh and a special thank you to um, Justice Scott Jew, who is uh, well known, uh, uh, I guess, not just in India, but elsewhere also. And I thank the invitation uh, from Ibad Khanna that, has, that I have received. In fact, uh, I was talking uh, about it yesterday to a friend in, 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 uh, in India, and he asked me, what is this about? I said, well, it is about an inter-community a dialogue promoting uh, harmony in India by people uh, uh, outside of India. And I gave, I gave him the significance, the fact that uh, the organization was, uh, was I guess, is a, less than a year old, was started in California uh, through the courtesy of Just Got You and, and um, the server. Um, so his response was, let me tell you, and I thought this was an interesting thing. He said, never trust, number one, never trust a religious leader who tells you how to vote. Number two, never trust a political leader who tells you how to pray. And number three, never trust an NRI, non-resident Indian, who tells you how to be patriotic. So uh, with that, uh, I, I, I told myself, you know, it's a very historic name about Kana. And, you know, my view is, you know, as much as uh, uh, just got you has talked about uh, uh, England, and its role, I think in general, the Western democracy and Western nations, uh, you know, the quality of life is in fact determined by how the majority treats the minorities. I think that is a, that's fairly true. But I would argue that in civilization states, uh, uh, civilization states like India, it's not really, the, 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 the quality of life is really not decided on the basis as much by religion as it is by the ruling class. It is how the ruling class treats all those which are disfranchised and obviously uh, the, the majority that actually is not in the ruling class. And, and I think that's, never has that been more true than act in, act in fact in Kashmir, where you, I really can't distinguish the ruling class on the basis of religion. You really have to distinguish ruling class on the basis of being a ruling class and how it has, uh, in fact, you know, even uh, for example, if we talk about the majority community, even they are in that community, whether it is uh, Ahmadis or it's uh, it's uh, Shias or others. I mean, the same issues exist for all minorities between the ruling class and the non-ruling class. And I'll give you an example of that uh, because I myself actually started as an advocate for the minority rights of Kashmiri pundits, but I realized at the end that it needs a holistic solution. And if the holistic solution is really much more uh, complex, but that's what is going to resolve the Kashmir issue, be it be the issue of Kashmiri Pandits or be it be the issue of, uh, of Kashmir in general. And I'll give you an example uh, uh, what I mean. Uh, there was an interesting uh, 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 editorial in Greater Kashmir and Rising Kashmir in, in May, uh, May 14, 2012. And certainly they were reporting that there are a lot of babies dying at GB Pant Hospital, which is a tertiary uh, a hospital where neonatal babies were coming in from various sub-districts, district and primary, secondary hospitals. And, and many of them were dying. 
And that news became a news on the May 14th uh, and, and was very characteristic because it came in the same both papers editorial. Now, I had already discussed that issue earlier in the same same year in 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 uh, on on the matter of uh, the quality of health in the uh, out, out out distant villages uh, and hamlets of of kashmir and i had already realized and after having talked to a lot of doctors in the valley there were literally 100 or more babies dying per month in these hospitals both gb pant as well as uh, laldad hospital before that in 2011 there were 100 babies per month dying there was not a single editorial. There was not a single comment. Nobody in the civil society of Kashmir, which was obsessed with politics, would care for the quality of the, the meager uh, health care in the distant remote villages of Kashmir. And certainly a, a, a predominant family's child had died at GB Pant, and certainly it became a news. So what I'm saying is when the ruling class got affected, then it became a news. When the, when the, when the people in remote villages were, were dying, their babies were dying, nobody gave a damn. So we have to remember, we are talking about essentially the quality of life that is determined by the ruling class and not necessarily by those uh, who are in a majority community or a minority community when, so far as Kashmir is concerned. So the question then becomes, you know, the, the, the topic for today is, 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 is democracy and disorder. Uh, it's a very interesting topic because Quite frankly, it is, in my view, the two sides of the same coin. As much as people would like to blame disorder uh, uh, for something like uh, stringency in democracy, but the truth of the matter is, it's like half full or half empty, uh, glass being full of glass being half empty. And you know, what, in other words, how many, how much of the, when do the freedoms give you the liberty to actually create anarchy? And we have seen that. Uh, I'm not going to give you instances, but there are instances in India, there are instances in the United States, there are instances in major, major, other uh, democracies. You do get to the point, and at the same time, uh, uh, you know, where, where, where do you see, uh, you know, the constitution which, which gives you essentially a, a certain degrees of uh, liberties and freedoms and to what extent you can also exploit them. So I think the issue of democracy and disorder is 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 uh, really really very interesting. Um, and, but going back to the I, I forgot the point. But going back to the Bharat Khana, I would argue uh, when when Akbar was sitting in uh, Fatehpur Sikri, uh, who created this uh, Bharat Khana, I think he was more talking about, quite frankly, how to get my hardcore Sunni uh, court uh, court court courtians to basically accept uh, Dine El Hai religion, and he was probably having some. Rajputs with him to essentially get that along. So it was again, I think Ibadat Khana itself had an issue of really the ruling class have, have not being open minded at that time to the idea that uh, that Akbar was trying to uh, promulgate. But it, uh, it's, it's ironical that the name kind of rings bell in me because I, I do know uh, how, how, how his courtiers absolutely did not want to encourage him with Dini Alai. But uh, here we are now today talking about this odd couple, the democracy and disorder. And, 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 and uh, quite frankly, you know, India, I think V.S. Naipaul put it best in a 1990 book, which is, uh, you know, which is titled India, a Million Mutinies Now. I mean, India is a country of million mutinies. So uh, there is always things going on. Uh, of course, Kashmiris tend to think, uh, you know, being in a sort of bubble that all the problems are really theirs and theirs alone and uh, and everything else uh, is going on all right and it's just that they are the victims they are the vic being victimized and 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 a part of that problem is the bubble that the intellectuals of kashmir have stayed in they they really can't see beyond the boundaries of their own state and 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 so the so their level of um, you know, grievances become an exercise in polemics instead of nation building which they have not unfortunately done and then, of course, you cannot have an honest debate within Kashmir. I mean, this is one of the sad tragedies that we see. And, you know, as much as, for example, Babur Qadri, who I didn't necessarily think I agreed with his positions, but nevertheless, he lost his life because he couldn't carry an honest debate and discussion in Kashmir. And he lost his life because, obviously, you, you, you uh, say anything against India, that's fine, that's great. But you say anything against Pakistan, you're going to be killed. 
I mean, it's, it, it happened with Sujat, it happened with it, it happened with a lot of other people. So we have to recognize that an honest debate in Kashmir is simply not possible because you cannot blame Pakistan for anything. You blame Pakistan for something, uh, you, you are not going to be living for a long time. And, 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 and I think those are some of the issues that you have to keep in mind when you are trying to be an, have an honest uh, dialogue with anybody that you have to recognize the, uh, the borders of what you are talking about. I remember many years back talking to a, uh, uh, a former retired Pakistani uh, general in, 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 in the United States at a meeting, uh, uh, was at the US IP, US United States Institute of Peace, where I gave a lecture. And after the meeting, he said, well, you know what? In, in India, dissidents are jailed. In Pakistan, dissidents are killed. That's how we solve our problems. I said, well, you know, we, we, we have a rule of the law. He said, well, he, you know, he obviously was cryptic about it. But my point is that, that, that we have to talk honest terms. And the honesty is that where are we today in Kashmir has a lot to do, quite frankly, how, how the situation evolved in the last 70 years. And, and, uh, and, and as much as, uh, you know, uh, uh, my friend Altaf Bukhari used, talks about glory days of Article 370, but I will, be, I will take you back, uh, in fact, to a few, few interesting events. Uh, the first event is, of course, the one uh, which was on 19 September of this year, when the army admitted that that the the ASPRA uh, Armed Forces Special Powers Act uh, guidelines that had they had uh, negotiated with the Supreme Court had been had been uh, not uh, rigorously uh, uh, scrupulously uh, implied or applied, and as a result of which, the three uh, uh, laborers, three unfortunate laborers from the jury uh, district. Uh, were, 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 were killed in a so-called Shupian encounter. And I think it was really, uh, a, 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 I would say, a, a, a very hallmark event when they, when they did that, uh, admitted it, uh, uh, and to, to an extent, I would argue, um, uh, that came about because of Army's new role in the, in the UT dispensation in, in Kashmir, which I will go about, which I'll discuss some more as we go down. But the reason I'm giving you this is that as much as this is an event that actually mm, created um, a, a new sort of sense of awareness about army and, and their responsibilities to be uh, with it, to follow the letter of the law, the fact is it was the army 10 years back that actually set this uh, stage for the events that happened since those 10 years. And what did happen 10 years back? On 30th April 2010, army killed, army personnel killed three infiltrators in the Machil sector of LOC in the, in the Kupwara district. And it turns out, again, those unfortunate people were laborers, porters from the Baramula district that were helping army and, and some, uh, obviously some, uh, some officers wanted some medals from the from the Indian Army uh, generals, and they decided that they were, they were, uh, they were uh, uh, Pakistani infiltrators, and they were they were killed. Uh, what happened, quite frankly, as a result of that event, was it set up in motion things within Valley, uh, primarily, unfortunately, or how you put it, was uh, was was that we had Mr. Omar Abdullah as the chief minister relatively in, inexperienced, already humbled by the, uh, uh, the Shupian experience of 2009, um, uh, when, the, when, the, when, the, uh, when those two girls uh, uh, were, were, uh, um, you know, were uh, drowned uh, in the Nala. And, and so we started with the summer of 2010, where we had stone pelting, um, uh, a, a very serious issue, after the fail, Matu was a uh, seventeen year old boy was killed and uh, and uh, we had threats coming from uh, from uh, all party Huriyat conference from Saeed Alisha Jelani. He started giving ultimatums. Uh, people were out on the streets. One hundred and twelve uh, stone pelters died. It was a very unfortunate thing. I think the government was uh, really in a doldrums. Um, there was considerable vandalism. There was burning of churches because there were some incidents where the Quran had been burnt. Uh, by a, by, a, by, a, by a Christian priest. So we had all kinds of things. 
But the, the interesting thing is that there was this continuous feeling at that time in the intelligence community that these these things were primarily driven by Pakistan, were primarily driven by Al Party Hurriyat Conference, and 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 between the two of them, they were pretty much uh, running the show and creating the, the 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 mayhem and disorder. Now, what happened was the elections of 2014 in the state, which was late year, which was which was after the BJP government had already come to power. Uh, earlier in 2014, but in the late year, one thing that reporters, journalists kept telling me, uh, and I was in constant touch with them, that the same people which have been told by Alija Jilani and Huria that they have to boycott the elections and nobody is going to show up at the elections, and 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 that was the feeling. Well, the attendance of the uh, electorate for the elections came out to be 65.91 percent, so about 66 percent or two thirds of the electorate voted. And guess who were many of the voters? The same people that were pelting stones on the roads. It was so obvious. Every journalist that I talked to said, sir, these are the same people who were on the streets before are, are today in the lines waiting to cast their ballot. And that, my friends, got the Indian government thinking. And this was a thinking that had been in the works for a long time. Who really, really, really controls these stone pelters who are out on the streets? Is it is it simply just the Pakistani interests, the Hurriyat conference, or is it something else? And those people participating in elections made it made it very interesting for the uh, the new BJP government in Delhi to make a reassessment. And their reassessment was that in fact the so-called political parties, pro India political parties, were part and parcel of this mayhem. They had actually uh, out sourced in, in modern technology, they had outsourced essentially this dissension to these stone pelters. And, and, and while they were reaping the benefits of the ruling class, uh, they were asking other people uh, to do this dirty work for them. And, and, and so it was very important that at that moment, because of the fact, the, because there were two things that happened. One was that it became very clear the, 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 out, the, the, the the, the uh, ruling class was essentially outsourcing uh, this mayhem uh, on disorder on the streets. And the two was you had a you had now a NDA government uh, which had come in power with the with a with a political mandate to change uh, the topography of the political political topography of the JNK state uh, because that was in their manifesto. And uh, and uh, actually, uh, those who know will tell you that Arun Jatli was put in charge of the new strategy. Uh, Arun Jatli, of course, uh, had his roots uh, or had the connections in, in in the state because his wife uh, was a was a what, was a daughter of a predominant um, Kashmiri Dogra leader, uh, and he put in place essentially. So, uh, what what came out of that actually was the blueprint that basically the uh, uh, the the uh, the the NDA two government followed. Uh, in terms of uh, the sequencing of the events that eventually led to August 5th. But one of the interesting things that intelligence community had discussed and described was that if we really want to see whether the, main, the ruling, ruling class is involved in this thing, we got to go and go down, the, peel the onion right up to the core, which means you build up who's, who is stone pelters connected to, who pays them money, where does that halka man go to the district uh, party man, where does that party man go up to the next senior level person and next senior level until you reach to the godfather of the ruling class. And the ruling class, of course, had multiple godfathers, depending on which political party you belong to. And at the end, so you had, you so, so the argument on one side was, you know, Kashmir is going to be in, on fire. Kashmir is going to burn. Leaders have threatened that blood will flow. Uh, thousands, uh, lakhs people will come out on the streets. Uh, the uh, the hands will be cut of the people who uh, try to do these kind of things. And the argument on the other side was that it can be a surgical process because now we know who are. Uh, this is a, this is this is a, essentially a very very sharp pyramid with a very sharp angle, uh, and 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 it's not going to take a lot of people. Uh, so as much as people in lakhs have come out, usually 
uh, many times in Kashmir. I mean, there have been hundreds, thousands of people with the same amount of security that we have had for, for the last uh, five, six, seven years in Kashmir. That has not stopped uh, people from coming out on the streets. But what happened was they made the surgical strike. They essentially uh, took about, I think that at the end, uh, almost 6,000 people were arrested. The, the uh, 270 of them were essentially uh, the ruling class politicians, uh, uh, out of which, of course, the very top core uh, was put in, uh, uh, in at the Centur Hotel. I think there were like about 30 or 35 of them. And the rest of them uh, essentially were, 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 were the lower tier people. And, and simply taking those 6,000 6, people in custody, or, which by the way, many of them, uh, almost uh, two thirds of them were released within three or four weeks, um, did it. They, they actually proved the ruling class is very much invested in the mayhem and disorder on the streets because that 6,000 class basically made sure nothing happened. There was shock and awe. Uh, the people who would normally be out on the streets wouldn't be. And it was very interesting because I was in the valley in October, I'm sorry, in November and December of uh, 2019. I met with a broad section of people, university professors, uh, journalists, uh, other intellectuals, NGOs, everybody was talking about this was a so certain. And even more surprising was the reaction because they were not, they were all out. I mean, as much as the narrative was that nobody can talk, the phones are not working. I mean, I was communicating from from my hotel, which was which was Radisson uh, near near Old Broadway, uh, uh, to to uh, Senator Sherrod Brown's office in the United States. Uh, the, 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 there's nothing wrong with 2G services. 2G services simply means your download speeds are different. It doesn't prevent you from even today. You can do uh, do uh, uh, you know you can do Zoom <laughs> and other things from. From uh, from uh, from uh, from the Srinagar, even though Srinagar doesn't have uh, 4G. Uh, my point is uh, that the the shock and awe was a big factor, and 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 and, and eventually the the the, the reality is uh, we have to accept the ruling class has a burden that, that they essentially allowed that that uh, law and order situation to impinge on the national security of the country to the point where the security apparatus in India is actually the most dominating factor in deciding the future of Kashmir. It's sad. It's not in political hands as much as you like to think of it is. It is, in fact, in the security people's hands. And previously, there was a feeling there was a security people, but they were the Dula types who would come uh, have, a, have a scotch with the, with, the, with the ruling class and go back to Delhi and say, everything is going on well, things are OK. I'm, I'm, you know, we had a great chat. That is gone, my friends. The security apparatus that is dealing with the situation today belongs to a different group of security interests, and 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 from their perspective, uh, uh, more has to be done. And I'll address that uh, in, in my in, in my closing remarks. Uh, so I would argue that is the first element that that really created the situation that eventually uh, you know BJP did uh, at the end of the day go where it was. But, but, but to me, actually, the more important element is the malfeasance of the ruling class. The, the political class, quite frankly, uh, uh, you know, people as much like, like to talk about 370 in terms of you know, the erosion of economy and this and that. The fact of the matter is that the thing that where Kashmiris in general were disappointed, Kashmiris like me, where I really thought by giving autonomy to the state, that you would actually create an enlightened uh, uh, people that will essentially have a human development and social development along the lines. What you created was a legislative assembly that was utterly corrupt, that essentially passed laws that only benefited the few, that whenever they passed the laws, lacked transparency, lacked openness, lacked governance. So the, the, the entire, so it didn't matter whether you were in the ruling party or out of the ruling party. The fact of the matter is, this was all a clique working together, essentially to create uh, you know, things that, that would, would be very different. I joined, I can tell you, in 2002, after the Indian parliament passed the RTI, I joined a group that, that was created to, to in, 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 uh, in, in, in Srinagar, and actually in Chadura, Badgam by Raja Muzaffar Bhatt. Uh, 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 who actually started the RTI movement in Kashmir? I joined that group. Bajat was one of the Bajat was one of the essentially uh, guidance people. 
And we saw how the legislators started manipulating the Indian uh, RTI Act to remove all the elements of you know, accountability, transparency, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the ease of submission of the RTI forms. I mean, everything was, 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 was messaged around. So the first law was passed in 2004, then we worked again. It was redone in 2008, and finally the last version that is working was working before the UT was 2009. I mean, and this thing happened everywhere. All the laws you look at, I mean, here's an interesting one. Everybody knows in Kashmir, the education was free. But people didn't realize that Kashmir, the education was not compulsory and free. It's a subtle difference, compulsory and free. So what you had is essentially that the ruling class was able to afford the education all the way along, but the people in general, uh, out in the villages, out in the, I mean, I mean you have to look at the depleted health situation of those schools, of those health centers. I mean, this is the government that 70 years has been talking about development. And when nothing was trickling down, the trickle down economy never went outside the ruling class and the people, I would say in English speaking community of, of, of Kashmiris, they basically out in the villages, the, the, the situation never really changed. So uh, Article 370 in my mind has nothing to do with, uh, with, with you know, whether you can buy the land or you don't buy the land. I think it has more, to me, it's more like the fact that there was a, a, a mafia of a, a ruling class together and that ruling class essentially um, uh, you know, subverted the thing. I mean, it was very interesting. There was no laws against domestic women's domestic uh, violence. There were no laws against transgender or Dalit rights. There was nothing about minority. I mean, you, I can go on and on. My point I'm making is the biggest element that impacted the 370, as far as the Kashmiris are concerned, was the nature of the laws that were passed. And these were these were these were basically victimizing those who are disfranchised and those who are poor and those who are at the bottom of the feed, uh, food chain. And, and so it was, it was basically, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, you could see it. Uh, I'll give you another example. Uh, the Comptroller Auditor General of India, CAG, by law is required to submit annually a report on the state of Kashmir's uh, government sector, government departments, as well as the uh, public sector units, PSUs. And every year that report, if you look at it, you go, go back as many as years as you want. If you look at it, you will find that, that it basically says there is no accountability. There's not, nobody knows how much money has been spent, how it has been spent, who did it go, how many uh, jobs were created, how many temporary jobs were created. Nothing is, nothing is there. And you would think that would be a subject of discussion in the legislative assembly. Now, how did they handle it in legislative assembly? They actually, everybody, it didn't matter whether PDP was running the country or a national conference or, or even Congress when Mr. Azad was there, it didn't matter. It would always be submitted on the last day of the budget session, which is by the way, a half day. And, and at, which, at which time nobody would read it because everybody is giving farewell lectures or uh, speeches at that time. And then it would be released to press and then everybody would uh, take stories out of the CAG report to show how much corruption happens. And, but not once was it ever discussed. Now here's an even more interesting part. I had an opportunity uh, to meet with Mirwais in Washington in 2005. Uh, I met him a couple of times, but let, let me address this particular meeting that I had with him. In that meeting, I told him, you know, if you really want to make an issue of the ruling class in Kashmir, of, the, of these political leaders that you, you basically think are pro-Indian uh, lackeys, uh, why don't you take a CAG, CAG issue as to why the controller Auditor General of India's reports are not discussed in, in, the, in, the, in the assembly, why they are not discussed on, on the basis of you know, how, how malfeasance is taking place at all levels up to the point where Transparency International of, of uh, Germany basically rated as, as the most corrupt state in India. Uh, I, he, and his answer was, ah, no, 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 that is an Indian government intrusion in Kashmir. I am not going to support such an activity. So you can see, because they themselves were actually part of that ruling class. I mean. I mean, a, a, a call from a, a, a Sayyid Ali Shah Jalani or Mirwais uh, to the power po uh, authority in, 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 in the valley never got challenged. They would do whatever those guys wished them to do. So it was all a cabal that was basically running together. Now, now am I making these things independently? Uh, I mean, am I, am I right, wrong in these issues? Well, let me tell you something. Uh, in, 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 in 2006, there was actually a classified table that was leaked out by WikiLeaks when WikiLeaks was bringing out these uh, American State Department cables. And this particular one dealt with 
David Wolfer, who was the ambassador, American ambassador to India, in a confidential note to uh, Washington on February 2006. And I'll, I'll, I'll read it verbatim. And he said, Kashmir politics is as dirty as Dal Lake. Co corruption cuts across party lines and politically connected Kashmiris take money from both India and Pakistan. The state administration gets rivers of money for development but the streets in JNK are appalling, even by Indian standards. And you really have to see, uh, you have to read the, uh, hear the news like Gulistan or something to see every day, people uh, looking at having no roads, bridges that have been uh, waiting for years to be built, uh, schools that have one school uh, actually uh, that has not seen a, a construction, partial construction 19 years back is still waiting for there. So, uh, so his, his point was, while the river of dirty money has led to a boom in Kashmiri household income and real estate prices, which is, I think, what Mr. Hasib Rabu likes to talk about, it also calls into question whether Kashmiri elite truly want a settlement. So we are talking about essentially a process where the malfeasance really ran to a very high level. And so you have to, uh, you know, you have to really uh, 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 look at that as, 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 a, as another factor. So you essentially have a situation, in my view, where you had obviously a opportunity where, where BJP was trying to uh, take its election manifesto of 370 forward. But I would argue they would not have succeeded. They would not have succeeded if they would not have gotten the votes in Rajya Sabha. And they got in the votes in the Rajya Sabha because of the legislative processes of Kashmir that laws were not fair to the minorities, laws were not fair to the disadvantage, laws were not fair to disfranchise. And because of that, they got the support from those kind of parties. And I would argue today that Article 370 was done in by Article 370. That was the reason why we are situation where we are having together. And in terms of then going one more step further and making it a UT, I think you have to just uh, uh, hear uh, from, from, you know, from, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Chief Secretary, Mr. B. V. R. Sudramaniam, who only had that say, said very interestingly that Kashmir was being run like a Ponzi scheme. And you guys, if you don't, I'm sorry, if you guys don't understand that the realities of what the situation is, and we talk about the polemics all the time because that's nice, that's sweet, and that's what that's what the you know the the the, the Greeks and the Romans did in the forums. Uh, we are not going to get anywhere. We have to understand what the ground realities are. And the ground realities are that if we want a Kashmir of our dreams and a Kashmir that I had envisioned, quite frankly, when that Article 370 was delivered, that did not happen. We have essentially a situation where the, 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 the politicians of Jammu and Kashmir have to earn, have to earn the statehood back because, because it's not going to happen by itself. And, and, and I would imagine, though, as much as people are right now saying, when I'm going to do this and when I'm going to do that, the moment this, the, the center announces uh, the, the elections, uh, I am sure all the parties are going to join, uh, notwithstanding what our, uh, you know, what our declaration that they have in, in their minds. Uh, but the fact of the matter is whether that... Sorry, Dr. Sazal, so we are yeah, I'll running out of time. I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm closing it in one minute. So whether that is sufficient, I think that is necessary, but whether that is sufficient to actually give you back the statehood, give us back the statehood, I doubt it. I think statehood will require the, uh, putting in place by the new chief minister, who so is elected in that process, uh, the, basically uh, a certain financial and, and security uh, standards that have to be met uh, before the UT uh, turns back into the statehood. I mean, it's my wish that had happened, I quite frankly uh, would like to see uh, the state uh, emerge uh, 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 in its normal fashion, but I think people have to also understand that there will be changes necessary to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sazal. Uh,